Did that wake y'all up? Uh, let's stand and join in singing, Bless the Lord, O My Soul. We do have several announcements that we want to mention. And uh, don't forget that our Margaret Lackey goal is 4000 and so far uh, given to date is $402. And uh, uh, just give for that. That is a state mission offering. All of the monies taken up for Margaret Lackey remain in the state, go for in-state missions. So 100% uh, of that is used for what is intended to be used for. And uh, don't forget about the adult men's Bible study this afternoon at 6 p.m., and uh, looking forward to that. It'll be a great time. Come and join us. And also the personnel committee election will be next Sunday, September the 26th. And more information in the newsletter will be sent out to you this coming week. And uh, if you haven't signed up for the blessing of the hunt, uh, please do. We need your help. We, we've got to have uh, volunteers to make this thing a success, and it will take quite a few volunteers. There's a sign-up sheet hanging out on the bulletin board. And it's actually a very thick sign-up sheet. When you look through, look under the area that you want to participate in, and there's numbers there. Uh, there's a few of the numbers that uh, uh, we can only use a certain number of people in that given or respected area. But there's some of the other numbers, if they run out, we can still add people to it. So it won't be a big deal to do that. But we need you to help us make this a success, and it is going to be a great a time for our church, a great experience, and its focus is evangelistic. It is to reach the lost for Jesus Christ. Uh, we, we don't just want to send out invitations to other churches to attend. We want to get the invitation out in our communities to let people know uh, about this because people will come and attend things like this where they wouldn't normally attend a regular church service and perhaps that will uh, get them in a position where we can introduce Jesus to them. And uh, I think everyone will be blessed by the speaker that we have, uh, Billy Moles. He has a powerful testimony and nature uh, played a part in that testimony. And so he'll share that when, you, when he gets here. Uh, don't forget about the Wednesday night suppers. The sign-up sheet is in the foyer. Once again, as I redundantly say week after week, if you forget to sign up, it's okay. Uh, just call us usually by lunch on Tuesday. That way we can add your name to it. And if you uh, don't call, they usually do cook a little extra as long as you don't bring an army uh, with you. They have a little bit of extra, so please uh, come and, and participate in that. It's not just about the food. It's a great time of fellowship. And then we have Bible study afterwards, so uh, please come and join us for that. Operation Christmas Child, you can still uh, join in on the fundraiser, even though we've, we've gotten through the pill bottles and so forth, you can still donate to that. And so if you'd like to donate toward Operation Christmas Child, please do so. And uh, also the Minister Music Search Committee, please remember them in your prayers. They are working and moving forward with uh, uh, searching and praying and seeking. So just keep them undergirded with your prayers. And also, in just a little bit, we'll have a Gideon speaker come and share with us, Dr. Dan Fulton. 
Uh, he is uh, a dentist in DeKalb, or was a dentist. He's retired now in DeKalb for 43 years. And he told me the best introduction for him would be the Gideon from Meridian. And so I think that is a very appropriate, <laughs> appropriate uh, introduction. And so we look forward to having him come and share with us, giving a Gideon report. And I want you to know that is also a very powerful ministry. And we uh, are thankful to be able to be a part of that ministry and getting God's word out in m multiple languages around the world. Also, we will take up an offering for the Gideons at the end of the service. There will be a deacon on each side in front of our tithe offering box, and uh, they will be holding a basket. So if you want to give to the, uh, the, the Gideon ministry, please give it uh, in the basket or make sure that you, if you write a check, uh, put what it's for on there or on your envelope if you put it in a special offering envelope or anything make sure you write on there what it's for but put it in the basket they'll be holding the basket when you go out and you can give uh, accordingly as you want to at that point i want to thank you once again for being here today i'm glad that you have chosen to join us and i hope and pray that today you will put aside every weight that besets us and that we will focus on the lord jesus christ and remember that it truly is about him you know, if we could really just yield ourselves to worship, it would change our lives and let it change us today because that's what's important. Please pray with me. Father God, I thank you for the opportunity. I thank you for the blessing of being able to come together in corporate worship. I know the last few years have been tough on us, Father, on all churches as we've gone through ups and downs and difficulties that we've never experienced before. But right now, we know that none of that matters. What matters is that we have come here today, some in person, some joining by internet. We are here today to worship you in an unhindered fashion. And I pray that today we will yield ourselves to you, giving ourselves totally to worshiping our Savior, Jesus Christ. I pray that you flood our souls and fill us with your grace. And I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, and God bless you. We're going to continue our worship service singing Days of Elijah, and this was a request, and uh, we're doing it. So y'all stand and sing with us. These are the days of Elijah. greater than our sin.
you don't know how glad I was when I looked online the night and saw these two rails coming up here. I spoke at Faith Baptist Church about two years ago, and I told everybody to bow their head and close their eyes, and I started giving the invitation. I started down the steps, missed the bottom step, fell on one hand right in front of the preacher's wife, caught myself, and she looked up at me, and I waved her off, finished giving the invitation. Nobody ever knew that I fell. I was in a terrible motorcycle wreck in 1976, and I had a pin put in my leg. And about three years ago, I was going to have this pin taken out, and about a week before the surgery, a friend of mine asked me, he said, well, what's the worst that can happen? I said, well, I guess the worst that can happen is they can't get the pin out, and it'll become infected. Well, guess what happened? But I'm going to have that knee replaced in a short period of time, and the next time I come, I'm going to run up these steps. <laughs> But I thank you for letting me be here today. I always enjoy coming here. This is a special place to me. I have a lot of friends, a lot of folks that I spend a lot of time with, and so it's a, a special place in my heart. I'm here today to, not to glorify the Gideon ministry. I'm here to glorify Jesus Christ. The Gideon ministry started with a promise that a young man made to his dying mother that before he would go to bed at night, he had spent time in the Word and on his knees in prayer before God. It's a ministry that's grown to 300,000 strong worldwide, a ministry that's established in 200 countries, a ministry that has one objective, and that's to reach the lost for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. How many of them? All of them. How do we do it? We do it through personal witnessing and placing this book. Folks, this is no ordinary book. This is the living, life-changing Word of God. This book contains light to guide you, comfort to console you, fire to warm you, and food to sustain you. This book reveals the mind of God, the original state of man, God's plan for our salvation, yet the doom of sinners. God was his author. Men wrote it, but it's infallibly inspired. Give it in life, open in judgment, and will last forever. With the help of churches like this, we've placed 2.5 billion Bibles at the rate of two and a half per second. With the help of churches like this, we're able to, to reach lost folks. This morning, as a representative of this ministry, I've come to ask three things from you. I've come to ask, first of all, for your prayers. We've been made painfully aware in the last couple of weeks that if you're caught in a Muslim country and you're handing out scripture, you have a Bible. If you have an app on your phone that has a Bible, a Bible app on it, it can cost you everything, including your life. We're going into Muslim countries now, and we need your prayers more than we ever have before. It was cold and dark, 4 o'clock in the morning, crying, quivering voice comes over the telephone. Is this the Gideon's? Why, yes, it is. How might I help you? She said, my name is Ruth Hedstrom. I checked into a motel, and I got a room on the fifth floor, and I planned to jump to my death. She said, my son has run off, my daughter's run off with a member of a son, uh, motorcycle gang. My son's in prison tonight. He got caught stealing money to buy crack cocaine. My husband has filed for a divorce, and so I decided to end it all. She said, I walked over to the window and I looked out in the night and never had the night seemed so cold and dark. Never had I felt so alone. And I turned and looked around the room for one last time and I noticed over by the bed there was a book. She said, sir, I'm not a Christian, but I walked over there and it was a Bible. And I picked it up and it opened to a place toward the back and it was 1 Peter, the fifth chapter, the seventh verse. And it said, cast all your troubles upon him. She said, sir, as I read that Bible, it was like God was speaking to me. Do you think God would allow me to cast my troubles upon him? He said, Ms. Hedstrom, not only would God allow you to cast those troubles upon him, he wants you to cast those troubles upon him. And they talked for a few minutes, and he said, well, can I pray with you? And he prayed that God would give her the strength to trust in God and let God put her life back together, pick the piece of her life back up and get them back in order. When he got through praying, she said, well, sir, I've got some money, and I can leave some money in this room. Do you mind if I leave the money and take that Bible? It might have saved my life. He said, Ms. Hedstrom, you don't leave any money in that room. We'll see that another Bible's placed there, and the conversation ended. About three weeks later, he gets a second call, and it's Ms. Hedstrom again. She says, sir, I just wanted to call let you know that my life's no better roses, but it's getting better every day. I'm starting to trust in that God of yours, and he's helping me pick the piece of my life back up and get it back in order. She says, sir, I want to thank you for being there that night, for being so kind and being so compassionate. I want to thank you all for letting me take that Bible. It was like a beacon of light when I was at the lowest and the darkest point in my life. But she said, sir, I want to thank you most of all for your prayers, how you had interceded on behalf of a woman you didn't know to a God that I didn't know. And I pray that someday I'm able to do the same. Folks, we need your prayers more than we ever have before. 
Second thing we need from you is Gideons. Most of the time when you have a Gideon come, he's old, he's gray-headed or bald-headed. We need young guys. We need some guys that can carry a box of Bibles. I couldn't even come up those stairs with a 35-pound box of Bibles today. We need some young guys who have not identified your place of ministry. Did you hear what I said? If you're a child of God, you've got a place of ministry. God didn't save you to sit, soak, and sour. God saved you to serve. And if God wants you to be part of this ministry, we welcome you with open arms. But if God wants you someplace else, that's where we want you. You see, the happiest, the most productive place you can be is dead center of God's will. And that's what we want for you. But if you have not identified your place of ministry, please consider the Gideons. Third thing I'm going to ask you to do, folks, is give. Give like you've never given before. Every penny that you give goes to the purchase and placement of scriptures. And this church has been so faithful. I told you, with your help, we've placed 2.5 billion Bibles at the rate of 2.5 per second. Every year, we place nearly 85 million copies of scripture. We have orders for 120 million copies. We've never had a surplus. We've never had extra. And, but last year with COVID and the pandemic and the churches being closed, our scripture receipts are way, way, way down. So I ask you to give as much as you possibly can. Dennis Donnelly, he was our past international treasurer. He was in Kenya and he was starting new Gideon camps. And they invited him to speak in a very remote village. And the pastor was so excited because he had never had a Gideon speaker there before. So finally they drove Dennis to the church and it was a mud hut with a thatch roof didn't have a beautiful facility like this, didn't have padded chairs or pews. They had just dug the floor up, flattened the dirt off, put a plank on it, and that's what you sat on. When the pastor got up, he made some announcements, did some praise and worship, and they took the morning offering up. And when that offering place came by Dennis, he looked in it and it had an egg, two small coins, a washer, a piece of glass, and a metal Coca-Cola cap. He thought, I can't ask these folks to give. They don't have any money. So finally, it was Dennis's time to speak, and he stood up, and the pastor introduced him. He said, I'll speak this morning, but let's not take an offering. The pastor never said a word. So he got up and spoke and started to sit back down, and the pastor stood up and said, we'll now take an offering for the Gideons. He said, I thought we agreed not to do that. He said, you mean you'd deny my people the blessing of giving money that a Bible could be purchased, that somewhere around the world somebody could come to know Jesus? Dennis said he couldn't say a word. And they passed that collection plate again. When it came back, it had a handful of the dirtiest little coins you'd ever seen. They had been stuck in shoes. They had been hidden away for rainy days. And when they took those coins and they took them through that current exchange rate, those folks had given enough money to buy two and a half Bibles. You see, that little mud hut church with a thatch roof had given enough money to meet the entire need of the Gideons International worldwide for one second. What about us this morning? Could we give a second's worth? Could we give a minute's worth? Could we give an hour's worth? 2 Corinthians 9, 16 says this. Remember this. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. Whoever sows generously will also reap generously. That each man should give as decided in his heart, not to reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. I ask you to pray for this ministry. I ask you to become involved in it, and I ask you to give cheerfully. Thank you. Thank you for the rail.
When I first heard this song um, called My Jesus by Ann Wilson, there were two things that came to my mind after I heard all the words in the song. And it's, one, it's for two people um, in the congregation. It's for one, the person who is broken and feels like they're kind of lost right now. It gives you a message of hope and peace. And then two, um, for the people who, aren't, who don't feel broken and um, are on the right path with the Lord, it, gives, it should give you um, a fire in your heart to go share the gospel. Um, so as you're listening to these words, I hope it does one of those two things to you. I hope it either lights you on fire for Christ to go share his gospel, or I hope it gives you peace and comfort. Are you past the point of weary? Is your burden weighing heavy? Is it all too much to carry? Let me tell you about my Jesus. Do you feel that empty feeling? Cause shame's done all it's stealing. And you're desperate for some healing. Let me tell you about my Jesus. Oh, he makes a way where there ain't no way. Rises up from an empty grave. Ain't no sinner that he can't save. Let me tell you about my Jesus. His love is strong and his grace is free. And the good news is I know that he can do for you what he's done for me. Let me tell you about my Jesus. And let my Jesus change your life. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Who can wipe away the tears from broken dreams and wasted years and tell the past to disappear? Oh, let me tell you about my Jesus and all the wrong turns that you would go and undo if you could. Who can work it all for your good? Let me tell you about my Jesus. He makes a way where there ain't no way. Rises up from an empty grave. Ain't no sinner that he can't save. Let me tell you about my Jesus. His love is strong and his grace is free. And the good news is I know that he can do for you what he's done for me. Let me tell you about my Jesus. And let my Jesus change your life. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah, amen, amen, amen. Who would take my cross to Calvary, pay the price for all my guilty? Who would care that much about me? Let me tell you about my Jesus, oh. He makes a way where there ain't no way rises up from an empty grave ain't no sinner that he can't save let me tell you about my jesus his love is strong and his grace is free and the good news is i know that he can do for you what he's done for me let me tell you about my jesus and let my jesus change your life hallelujah Hallelujah, hallelujah, amen, amen. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Let my Jesus change your life. Thank you so much. Boy, that's such a blessing. I'll tell you what, the Lord has just really been present and speaking to our hearts this morning. I, 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 I'm just so blessed with uh, the, the, the talent that we have up here uh, that has been dedicated to the glory of God. That's an amazing thing. And I want to thank you, brother, for the message just a few moments ago. I, I tell you, it's, it's so important that we get the Word of God out, that people meet Jesus Christ before it's too late in this world. 
Today we're going to be uh, following up with a subject that you might think, well, how's that going to go with anything? Last week I preached on, on jealousy. This week we're going to preach on jealousy also. And uh, jealousy, in, but the way I want to focus on it today is how do we handle it when we're the one targeted by jealousy? And I, I want you to know that when it comes to jealousy, we all have that within us. And I, I've said that last week, but I want you to know we all have that. We have the ability to let that out if we're not careful. We have to restrain it. We have to control it. We have to subdue it. We have to put it under the control of God and let him lead. Otherwise, it can overtake us very easily. And uh, today we see this quite often. It's, it's really no more prevalent today than it has been in the past years, past decades, past centuries. It's really no more prevalent. But sometimes things happen in the world that make us see things that we haven't seen for a long time. It brings it to light. And today we see uh, a lot of jealousy. We see that because uh, basically people feel entitled to what you've worked for or what you have. They want what you have. They want uh, to obtain what you have obtained. And sometimes they want that without paying the price. And uh, what happens is they become resentful toward you when you seem to prosper in life. And as I shared last week, please listen to me. If someone gets something, if someone gets a promotion, if someone acquires a new home or buys a new home, be thankful for them. Be happy for them. As I shared with you before, if, if my neighbor were to buy a new home, you know, I, I would be happy for them. I, I would be excited for them. When my children bought homes, I was excited for them and for us too. I was excited that knowing that something that we did actually spilled over into their lives and, and gave them a little responsibility. So I was proud of that. But I find that today what happens is we find ourselves lost. Now I want to explain this. We're saved, we may be saved, but we find ourselves lost in all the burdens and the cares of the world. And I want you to know that that is a tactic of the devil. That is nothing but the devil because when you're saved, he knows that you've been found by Jesus and that you have potential to do great things in Christ and the very first thing he wants to do is get your focus off of Jesus on something else. And sometimes that happens through the burdens and cares of the world. Because we carry a lot of them. I mean, folks, let's just be honest. There's not a person in here today that doesn't have a burden that they brought with them to this church. Of some sort, of some manner, of, from some area, you brought something with you. And I want to say praise God that you brought it to the church. Because you know what? The church is where we need to be bringing our burdens. It's the place where we come and we can put our burdens aside because the Holy Spirit's working in us. And when that happens, we're able to lay these things down at the altar and we're able to allow the Word of God to penetrate the depths of our soul. And there is where we find strength. We find strength in the Lord Jesus Christ when we do that. And some of the burdens is that we may be dealing with someone who is jealous of us over something. Jealousy is contagious, it is infectious, and it will corrupt you if you allow it to get into your life and your Christian walk. It will distort it, I promise you. Jealousy has ruined marriages, it's ruined families, it's ruined churches, it's ruined businesses. Jealousy is a bad thing. It is. And my question today, which is the title of today's message, is how do you respond to jealousy? Well, in this passage, I'm going to read, and I'm going to refer back and forth to chapter 18 and, and uh, of 1 Samuel, uh, and, and we're going to be at chapter 24 today, but I'm going to read a little bit and refer around a little bit to share a a few things with you that I think is important. And by the way, I want you to know this. People will sometimes say, well, the Bible doesn't give an answer to everything. Oh, yes, it does. I want to tell you, it absolutely does. There's some things it doesn't say unequivocally stated the way that we want to state it. And, and you say, well, let me, let me just give you an example. 
Well, the Bible doesn't say thou shalt not commit abortion. No, but it says thou shalt not murder. And so it, it covers it all, and it covers it. And when we stop, if we don't just read it like some kind of fable, and we stop and take an in-depth look at the people, I don't want to call them characters because characters is what's in a story. But if we stop and take an in-depth look at the people that we're speaking of, that, that their lives are laid out before us, what you'll find is that they dealt with the same issues that we deal with, sometimes on a greater scale. They dealt with depression. Saul and David both dealt with depression. We'll talk about that some other time. But they dealt with jealousy. And it turns out that one of the two, Saul, as you know from last week, he was the one that was jealous. He was intimidated by David. And he let jealousy creep into his life. And by the way, once again, just to reiterate, jealousy is a feeling. A feeling is a response to something. If someone tells me sad news, I feel sad. If someone tells me something happy, I feel happy. And so the feeling is a response, and we have to be careful that we don't allow our response, our feelings, to dictate what we do in this world. When we live by our emotions and feelings, I'm telling you we will be unstable and we will not glorify the Lord in what we do. We can't let our feelings and emotions dictate our lives. Now, I'm not saying that they're not important. I'm not saying that they're not a part of our lives, but we can't let every action be a result of, uh, of feelings and emotions. We can't let it be that way. In this passage, Saul has already uh, channeled his jealousy toward David. David, as you know, uh, it all started in chapter 18 with a song that the people sang to him. And if you were to, I, I don't, you don't have to turn back over there, but if you were to look back over there in verse 7 in chapter 18, it says that they sang a song concerning Saul that he had slain thousands, his thousands, and David had slain his ten thousands, and Saul was offended by that. That caused Saul to see David as a threat to the throne. In other words, David would be the one to dethrone him and take over. And David would battle with this for a period of time as he was a target of Saul's jealousy. If you remember, the thing that Saul said was that from that day forward, he eyed Saul. That's verse 9 of chapter 18. He eyed Saul. In other words, he looked for anything he could to accuse David of manipula manipulation and treason, treachery, you name it. Anything he could find, he used it. Well, in this passage, we have here, David has fled. And it says this, beginning in verse 1, Now it happened when Saul had returned from following the Philistines, that it was told him, saying, Take note. David is in the wilderness of En Gedi. Then Saul took 3,000 chosen men from all Israel and went to seek David and his men on the rocks of the wild goats. So he came to the sheepfolds by the road where there was a cave. And Saul went in to attend to his needs. David and his men were staying in the recesses of the cave. And then the men of David said to him, this is the day of which the Lord said to you, Behold, I will deliver your enemy into your hand, that you may do to him as seems good to you. And David arose and secretly cut off the corner of Saul's robe. Now it happened afterward that David's heart troubled him because he had cut off Saul's robe. And he said to, this man, to his men, The Lord forbid that I should do this, to my master, the Lord's anointed, to stretch out my hand against him, seeing he is the anointed of the Lord. So David restrained his servants with these words and did not allow them to rise against Saul. And Saul got up from the cave and went on his way. And David also arose afterward and went out of the cave and called out to Saul, saying, My Lord, the king. And when Saul looked behind him, David stooped with his face to the ground or to the earth and bowed down. And David said to Saul, 
Why do you listen to the words of men who say, indeed, David seeks you harm? Look, this day your eyes have seen that the Lord has delivered you into my hand in the cave. But someone urged me, and someone urged me to kill you, but my eyes spared you, and I said, I will not stretch out my hand against my Lord, for he is the Lord's anointed. Moreover, my father, see, yes, see the corner of your robe in my hand, for in that I cut off the corner of your robe and did not kill you. Know and see that there is neither evil nor rebellion in my hand, and I have not sinned against you, yet you hunt my life to take it. Let the Lord judge between you and me, and let the Lord avenge me on you, but my hand shall not be against you. Let us pray. Father, thank you for this word. I pray today, Father, that as we deal with this thing we call life and we deal with the problems of life that we realize and that we focus, we realize we need to focus on you and that as we do focus on you, we'll find the strength that we need to overcome and to move beyond what we face every day. I pray for your grace to abide in our lives and for your Holy Spirit to open our hearts, and I pray it in Jesus' name, amen. When we think about jealousy, it causes uh, sometimes us to look at life a little differently. And it's something you need to know. Some of the things I'll say today doesn't mean that uh, some of the things that I say will actually overlap to other things because the truth is there's just sometimes rude people out there that say rude things and there are people that, that can't do anything but be sarcastic about everything. That doesn't necessarily mean they're jealous. It just means that they need to learn some manners. And uh, so that's just something that I want you to know. So don't think that the things I say today means that everybody that does something to you is jealous. You will eventually discover who is and who's not. I uh, will say that, that sometimes we don't necessarily know how to respond to jealous people. Sometimes we don't recognize the jealousy at first. And by the way, most people, when they're jealous of you, they're very sneaky about it in the beginning. It doesn't, they don't just show up and all of a sudden they're, they're just really jealous of you. That's not how it works. They always try to work their way on the inside. They want to be your friend. They want to be close to you. They want to learn your secrets so they can tell those things and use them against you in some way or some form as life goes on. And so you think that they may be your friend, but then you start seeing signs, and sometimes we begin to ignore the signs that we see because we think, Oh, they really do. No, I'm just reading into that. They wouldn't do that. And if we're not careful, what will happen is we will become suspicious just like the jealous people. Because let me tell you, jealous people are always suspicious of other people. They are. They're always suspicious. And that's something that, that Saul dealt with in his life. Everything David did, he was suspicious about it. That's why he eyed it. He wanted to pay attention to everything. He thought there was an ulterior motive to everything that he did. Well, I want you to know that sometimes we are the recipient of good things in this world because there's still good people out there, and not everybody that does something nice for you has an ulterior motive. Not everybody that's nice and everybody that's kind, not everybody that's polite has a problem going on where they're targeting you. Sometimes they're just good people, and we need not forget that. I want you to know that. There's good people out there. There's good people in this church. There's good people in the next church. There's good people in Walmart and, and, and Winn-Dixie. And there's good people everywhere you go. But I also know that there's bad people out there. And I'm not oblivious to that. But I don't want you to spend your life focusing only on the bad people. I want you to focus on the good people because if you focus on the good people, it's likely that you will become, if you're not already, you will become one of the good people. And you will do things just for the sake of doing it. No recognition needed. No recognition desired. You just simply do what you do because the grace of God is present in your life. And that's important. But at some point, you have, I'm certain, been the target of a jealous person. Maybe... Maybe uh, if you haven't, unfortunately, this is kind of discouraging, but you're going to be before you leave this world more than likely. Jealous people exist. They exist for various reasons, and, and sometimes um, they are more abundant 
than we want them to be. I'll say it that way. Jealous people, they're cunning. They're slick. They're smooth. They can ease right in and never make a ripple in the water. They can come along and, and you think that they're your best friend and then somehow or another you figure out that they're not. And I know that probably in your school days that you've experienced something like that. I know that I have and, and I believe I can safely say that during uh, school years or in, in your teen years, or maybe your older adult years, you've experienced someone like that. Whether it was in school or on the job, people uh, seem to see you as a threat. I remember taking a job one time and uh, the people said, okay, you need to slow down with your work because you're making us look bad. And I'm thinking, you need to pick it up a notch is what you need to do because it's working too slow. Well, I didn't change a thing, and what happened was it created a little bit of jealousy because I'm, quote, making them look bad. So they started finding fault in everything that I would do. And when they would find fault in everything that I would do, they would run tattle on me to the boss, but they were my friend behind uh, well, to my face, but not behind my back. And so I figured that out very quickly. And uh, eventually, I'll go ahead and tell you that uh, my boss was a great guy. He eventually left the company, and he called me and asked me would I come to work for the company that he went to work for. And I said, yes, I will. And so I appreciated that fact. I appreciated the fact that he noticed that I was doing my job in spite of all the tattling that was going on. And you see, that's what jealous people do. It's not that I had more than they had. It's not that I was given any more pay, not that I was given a greater position. It's just that I was more attentive to what I was doing and paying more attention to what I was doing. And therefore, it created a problem with them because they had two choices. They could either get up off of it and, and move forward or they could bring me down and, and let me fall in line with them. And I chose not to align with them but to do what I felt I needed to do, and that was to give 100% to my task that was before me. And that's what happens sometimes. David was a man. He came in. He had absolutely nothing. He was a shepherd boy. He was broke. I mean, he didn't have anything. He'd be what we would call one of the college students today. They don't have anything. They're broke. They don't have any money. They don't know how they're going to eat. They don't, they don't know. I mean, they don't, they're, they're absolutely broke. They want to come to church maybe, but they don't have the gas. They want to go to whatever, but they don't have the gas. They need this, but they don't have the money to get it. And so that was a picture of David. David had found favor in the sight of Saul until, until the people began to no, take notice of Saul. And when the people began to take, I mean of David, and when the people began to take notice of David, then Saul became jealousy. Uh, and the jealousy in, in, it just engulfed his life. Let me tell you, when people do things that draw attention off of you, it's not because they're intentionally doing it. Maybe it's this, that we need to kick it up a notch and step up to the plate and do a little bit more. Maybe that's what it is, but what happens is we begin to target another person with jealousy. Why are they doing this? Why are they participating in this? Why are they making me look bad? Well, folks, sometimes people will try to make you look bad, but the people who try to make you look bad, if you can just hold on, it'll make full circle and it'll come back and it will expose itself. I assure you that it will. It will. At times, at times we, we're shocked to even find out about jealous people. We're shocked to find out about it. One of the things that happened, if you go back to chapter 18, let me just catch you up a little bit. After Saul eyed David, he found out that one of his daughters loved David. And so he said, I'm going to give you my daughter as a wife. And David said, no, I, I mean, basically David said, I'm broke. I have nothing. I, certainly I shouldn't be in a, a family of royalty per se. And he insisted. So he, he went through all of the servants to David is the way he did this. And so they got married. And then Saul was in a room, and David would go in and play music for him. David was in there playing music, and, and let me tell you, jealousy leads to depression, by the way, and we'll talk about that in another time. But he was in there playing music for him, and Saul had his spear in his hand, and his intent was to thrust the spear through David and pin him to the wall. That was his intent. It says it plain and, and clear in chapter 18, as plain as it can be. And so he, David managed 
to get in, out of his way a couple of times. I'm not sure David realized at that point what was going on. He probably thought it was a little unusual that he had his spear, but I want you to know that David was still at a point where he was not suspicious of Saul. He wasn't suspicious of him at all, so it probably wouldn't have, have really uh, set in, in into his mind and weighed on his heart what was about to happen. And so after he married his daughter, after David married Saul's daughter, David attempted this again, and Saul's daughter told him about the plan, and so she helped him escape because she truly loved David, and the people loved David because of the type of man that he was. Well, all that did was create further problems between David and Saul because Saul became even more angry at David. Now, I want you to know this. A jealous person will focus on nothing but envy and revenge. That's what a jealous person will do. It will corrupt them. It will take over their minds. That's what they'll think about day in and day out, how they, can, how they can get the best of you. And so we get to this position here in chapter 24 where Saul has uh, sent out these men, his men. I mean, it's kind of amazing, 3,000 chosen men from Israel. That's a lot of people. Of course, David had men following him. But he sent them out so that they could kill David. And, and in Saul's mind, I want you to notice this, Saul truly believed that if he could get rid of David, that it would solve all of his problems. But let me tell you, David wasn't Saul's problem. Saul was Saul's problem. And you need to know that. Matter of fact, if you go back to chapter 18 and look at verse 10, what you'll discover is it says this happened on the next day after Saul began eyeing David that a distressing spirit from God came upon him, and Saul also took note that the Spirit of God had rested on David. And that even created more problems. When you're jealous of others, now I'll tell you this, it will distort your way of thinking, it will distort your mind, it will ruin your life if you allow it to do that. We have to get control of it. So what do you do if you're targeted by it? Saul targeted David. And he sent his men out to get him. He sent them out to the, to the, to the, uh, in, in, in Getty. And he sent them out there to, to get him and to, to take care of him, to kill him, to eradicate him so that he would not have any issues. Well, in the process of this, David had a choice to respond. God had told David that he would give his enemy over into his hand. And I want you to notice this that he could do what he believed was right with the enemy. Now, I want you to stop and think about this with me for a moment. Why would David, uh, God say that to David? God had confidence in the decision-making that David had in his life. He had confidence in his spirituality, and he believed that David would make the right decision. And what we notice is that things began to escalate to a point where they went in to rest for the evening and David cut off the hem of, his, of Saul's garment. Now, I want you to notice, first of all, if you're going to deal with people who target you with jealousy, you've got to practice restraint. I want you to hear me. This is hard to do because, folks, I want to tell you that sometimes it's hard for your pastor to keep his mouth shut. I want you to know that. It's hard for that to take place, but I've discovered it's hard for church folk to keep their mouth shut sometimes. It's hard for us to do that, and when you're being targeted by jealousy, restraining oneself is one of the most difficult things we will do. It's hard not to say something. It's hard not to retaliate. It's hard not to simply lash out. It says that David went in and cut the corner of his garment off. David went in, and, and after in verse 5 of chapter 24, after he returned, his heart was troubled because he had done that to Saul because he had disrespected in his own mind and own way of doing things, he had disrespected Saul. David restrained himself. Even in a, heighted, a, a heated moment, a moment where everything had escalated to a point David had the opportunity to kill Saul and take over right then, but that wasn't God's will. And David knew that it wasn't God's will, and David stood before Saul. And David cut his garment, and he took a piece of his garment, and he, was, he went back, and after he, he was overcome by emotion on this and guilt, he restrained not only himself, but his men. If we're going to combat 
jealousy, we are first going to have to restrain ourselves. Sometimes we immediately launch into a defense. We begin to defend. We begin to uh, try to explain things. We begin to try to justify our position. Don't do all that. Because what that does is it further feeds the fire and it fuels it and it begins to take off from that point. Because I'm going to tell you something. You cannot reason with a jealous, jealous person. You can't do it. I'm just, I'm just telling you, you can't do it. And so there's no reason in even attempting. Sometimes the less you say, the better off you are. Let it slide and let it go on because people will eventually, they might buy into it for a little while, but they will eventually take notice of what's going on. They will see that. If you press on doing what you're supposed to do, people will begin to notice that. If you practice restraint in your life, let me tell you something else that you don't need to do is begin huddling and talking about someone who is targeting you with jealousy. Don't do that. Don't respond to it. Don't participate in any conversations outside of that. I remember years ago I had a group of ladies came, they came to me because of one person in the church that was disgruntled over a situation of her own making. And uh, they said, Preacher, you've got to go and apologize. I said, well, I've already apologized, but you need to know that this, this is as far as it goes. It's not going any further. And they said, well, what are you going to do about it? I said, I'm not going to do anything about it. And what do you mean? I said, this person needs to repent. And that's all I'm going to say. That's all I'm going to say. And they said, well, preacher, how can we help the situation? Because they called me all the time. I said, let me tell you how to help this. Don't get in these powwow sessions. When they call you complaining, tell them, do me a favor. Call the pastor. Call the man and talk to him about what your problem is, and you two work through it. And if you do that, what you'll discover is that three or four times, this person is going to call you with the same thing, but eventually they're going to realize that they're not gaining any traction, so they're going to just stop it. And when, when it stops, it stops. And let me tell you what happened. Apparently, the person that I told that to, was four of them there, Apparently, the one I was directly speaking to did that. Because about a month went by, and this person that was disgruntled had a change of heart. But let me tell you, if you keep feeding it, it turns into a monster. Feed a stray animal and see what happens. They're going to keep coming back. They're not going to pass up a free meal. You feed a stray cat, you feed a stray dog, they're going to come back. You feed them, they're going to come back. And, and the truth is we can feed good things or we can feed bad things. And if we feed that kind of stuff, it's going to continue to grow. And I'll tell you, it'll get fat. It'll get really fat and it'll get really bad. Tammy has a bird feeder. And it's, it's in a pole that sits in the ground. It's, I guess the top of it's about, well, the pole's about this high, but the bird feeder's about this high off the ground. She filled it up Friday night, and Saturday morning, it was empty. Now, now this happened overnight. I'm like, that's odd that the birds would come out at night and devour uh, two pounds worth of seed. So last night, I filled the bird feeder up because I'm thinking, uh, maybe she dumped that stuff out. I filled the bird feeder up, and I put the bird feeder out, and two hours later, this bird feeder was empty. Okay, it was dark. We figured out last night what's getting the bird feed. We've got deer coming into the yard eating the bird seed, and we live in town. My point is, they figured out that there's bird feed there, bird seed and feed. They not only came one night, they know it's there, so they're coming back to feed again. And if you choose to put out the feed, if someone's laying it out there and you choose to participate in that, let me tell you, they're going to keep coming back. You have to cut it off sometimes and say, I'm not going to participate in that. David restrained himself. He restrained himself first. When he restrained himself, he said, I'm not going to hurt or harm God's anointed in any way. 
I shouldn't even have cut the hem of his garment off. I'm not going to do this. This is it. We're not going to hurt him. He is a man of God. He is God's anointed man, and I will not participate in this. We won't do it, nor will I let you do it. And so David restrained himself. And restraint is a very important thing. It is. A few years ago, I was preaching in a nursing facility. And uh, mind you, there are a lot of people in the nursing facility have Alzheimer's. And you have to know that when you go in there. Matter of fact, the nurse told me it takes a special person to preach in there. And I said, you think I can come back? So uh, anyway, just making a little bit of light there. But I was preaching. And in the middle of the message... This dear, sweet lady, she gets up and she walks up to me and she puts her finger right on the end of my nose. And I want to tell you, she used adjectives to describe me that I haven't heard men say. She said everything that I could imagine and some that words that I haven't heard. And she called me everything under the sun and she let me have it. And I'm standing there and everybody's just as calm as they could be sitting there, and I'm standing there, and, and uh, she's blood red. I mean, she's furious. She's mad. And after she said her piece, she turned around and walked over and sat down, and I just went back to preaching. What are you going to do? And at the end of the message, she came up, and she said, Preacher, I want to thank you for that message. It blessed my heart today. And I'm like, Wow. But I realized, I realized there was an issue there. And my point is this. I could have reacted or I could have kept my mouth shut and I chose to keep my mouth shut. The one time your preacher did the right thing, I kept it shut. And afterward, the nurse came up to me and she said, it takes special people to do this. And I said, well, I don't know anything about that. But she said, I appreciate the way you handle that. She has advanced Alzheimer's. And uh, I said, I, I picked up on that very quickly. No response was needed from me. Because you see, what I know was that not only did I pick up on something being wrong, everybody else did too. And if you handle it with restraint, people will take notice of that when it goes the right way. If I'd have lashed out and we got into an argument, it would have only made things worse and it would have been senseless and absolutely useless. No purpose whatsoever could have been served from that. Well, it's the same thing when you feed into the things that jealous people try to do to you. It serves no purpose. It's unjustified. It wastes your time and it will steal you of your joy and happiness if you allow it. But the second thing David did was he reassured Saul. I want you to notice the chance that David took in what he did. And this is a continuation of his restraint. But his restraint led to reassuring Saul. It says that David ran out behind Saul when he left the cave in verse 7 and following says that he went out of the cave and he looked, Saul looked behind him. He called out to Saul. And David got down on, his, on the ground and put his face toward the ground. And he began to talk to Saul. He had the garment, the hem of the garment in his hand. And after he talked to him, he said, he told Saul, I want you to notice what he said to Saul. He said, why do you listen to people? who are telling you that I want to harm you. Why are you listening to this? You see, if it fell on deaf ears, they wouldn't have had that encounter there. But it fell on to someone who was feeding off of it, and therefore, Saul acted on it. And David said, I seek not to harm you because you are my Lord. Small ill. You are my Lord, you're my master. And you are God's anointed. And I want you to know, Saul, that last night I slipped in 
to the cave, and I want you to know that I stood over you, but I had no intention of killing you. I just took your garment to show you that I meant you no harm. And I wish I could say that that would be the end of the story and it was a happy, sweet ending and everybody lived like Little House on the Prairie after that, but that wasn't the way that it worked. That's not how it happened. And so Saul accepted that and they, they went through a process of basically reconciling with one another and, and, and then it would later happen again. If you flip over a little bit further, you'll find that there was a second occurrence where that happened, which is where... Uh, things got a little chaotic. We won't go into all that today. Things got chaotic from there. But as he, as he showed him his garment, Saul recognized that the Spirit of God was on David. He recognized it. And there was a reconciliation that took place, but it was short-lived. But Saul needed some reassurance, but yet he wasn't willing to accept it. Verse 5, verse 8, verse 12 talks about reassurance. David wanted to reassure Saul that if he meant him any harm, he had ample opportunity to do so. But he didn't. And so he went out in a humble fashion and he approached him, showing him the respect that was necessary as his king. He didn't have to agree with him. He just went out before him and he bowed before him. And he said, look, I don't mean you any harm. I don't want to hurt you. We just should get along and you've got to stop listening to these people, King Saul. You've got to stop because they're lying to you. It's not the truth. It's not so. And Saul was reassured by David. And David tried everything he could to reassure him. And I, and I want to tell you, if a person's loyal to you, that should stand for something all by its own self. Because that loyalty speaks loudly. And, and it wasn't the, the issue. Now, please note, uh, you got to know this. David was being targeted, not the one targeting. So therefore, he was doing the reassuring. And he was trying to lead him away from that jealousy. He was trying to lead him away so that he could, they could have the relationship and he knew that, that he wasn't going to harm him. He wanted him to understand that he wouldn't harm him. But I want you to know, if you look at verse 10, you'll discover that David respected, and this is kind of an overlap, but he respected God's anointed. He respected the man that God had put as king. I know the people chose him, but God granted it. And, and he he respected him. He, dis he treated him with the highest level of respect. And listen to me, when people target you with jealousy, if you're respectful to them, it takes away from their ability to accuse you of wrongdoing. Because when you snap back at them, when you're uh, sarcastic with them, when you're rude to them, when you gather in huddles, it all comes out and it points to make you look like the bad person. And in reality, you're not. But you bought into that. And David respected God's anointed. He respected them. And we should learn to respect people. I'll tell you, do you, if you just stop and think, do you ever think what the world would be like if people just respected one another the way that we should? If we respected life, if we respected each other, if we just loved each other and helped each other and did everything that we could to encourage each other, do you think that the world would be a better place? I do. And let me tell you how it starts with you and me. You are probably going to be a target of jealousy in your life. And let me share with you three brief things under the third heading, how to survive jealousy in our clothes. First of all, if you're going to survive jealousy, the first thing you must do, we could call it A, is you must affirm your value. You have to determine that you're a person of value, that you're a person of worth, that you have something to contribute, and no matter what, you're going to give your best to what you're doing. 
I couldn't tell you how many times I've told my children, Tammy and I both, if you do something, do it with all that you have. Give it your best shot. Don't just let it, don't, don't just have do it. Don't just get by with it. And I, and I want to tell you, I was so proud the other day. My son, uh, he, he, was, he, he works for a trucking company, and uh, he does a lot of fabricating stuff. And he noticed that some of the guys on their welding are rushing through it, and the weld is inferior. And so they started fussing at him, you need to speed it up, not, not the owner, but the workers. You need to speed it up. You don't have to waste that time. He said, no, this is a reflection of my work and me. And he said, when you look at my weld and you look at your weld, you can immediately tell a huge difference. And he said, people are depending on this weld to hold. And so I said, well, how are you handling that? And he said, this is what I'm doing, Dad. He said, every truck that I do this to, putting on these, these particular parts, every truck that I work on, I weld my initials in the bottom of it. I flip it up and I take it and I weld my initial CP. So if it ever comes back and they say, no, nah, uh, Craig did that, he said, no. If my initials are not on it, I didn't do it. And I was so proud, and let me tell you why, because it will speak for itself. And the fact that somebody else would want to take credit for your work says something about your work. It's a big deal. Affirm your value. Affirm your worth. And when you do that, decide to give 100% to whatever you do. Do it. Give 100% to it. We have to learn that. Even when people target you with jealousy, and sometimes that will be the cause of the jealousy, as I said in the beginning. But B would be to prioritize your needs. What's most important right now, retaliating or simply doing what I need to do and, and focusing on what's going on right now and, and giving my all to the task? Get past it. You know, one thing that happens when we find out that we're the target of jealousy is we, we become angry. Why? Why do I deserve this? Well, you don't deserve it, but you've got to get over this because you're going to experience a lot of things in life that you don't deserve. But let me tell you one more thing that you don't deserve that you can get over. You don't deserve heaven, but if you ask Jesus into your heart, even though you don't deserve it, he's given it to you. He's given you that eternal life, that salvation. And so you need to prioritize your needs. My need is to glorify Jesus and to make him look good in every situation. Every situation provides you an opportunity to prevail as a victor and show the glory of God in your life. This is what happened to David. When David prevailed through this, Saul had no question that the glory of God was resting on David. Saul knew this. He saw this. He saw that the Spirit of God was guiding David. And and God had given his enemy into his hand, and because of the wisdom that God had placed in David, David did the right thing. But the final thing is reflect on the good. What can come out of this? What can come out of this is other people will see how you handle it. And they can gain a lot of trust and they can be encouraged greatly by what you do. And I want to tell you, friends, today we need encouragement in this, in this sick, sin-filled world. We need it badly. We need encouragement every day. If you, I'll tell you the best thing that we could do, including me, is turn the news off and just live our lives. That'd be one of the best things we could do. But there's so much discouragement out there. And, and there's so, much, so many things going on that, that is just absolutely ridiculous in our day and time. In a society as modern as we are, the things that are happening, they're discouraging. And I know I get discouraged when I think about what is going to happen you know, to my grandchildren and my great-grandchildren. I think about all that. It becomes very discouraging to me. But I have to stop and remember that God's got this thing. 
that he's not surprised by any of this. And he's not surprised when people target you with jealousy. It happens. It's going to happen. And we have to handle it the right way. We have to restrain ourselves. We have to reassure uh, the person that we don't mean them no harm. And we may do it very tactfully, of course. But we also have to learn to respect those people who are targeting us with jealousy. We have to respect them. For whatever reason, they bought into it and they feel that uh, threatened by you in some way or another. And you just have to... You just have to stop. And, and when you stop, affirm your value, prioritize your needs, and reflect on the good and move on. Don't let them control your life. Don't let them control your emotions. Don't let them do it. Give them zero power in your life. One of the things that I, I've noticed through the years is that people have a lot of things in their life, especially from the past, that they deal with. And when they deal with things from the past, sometimes it is a result of jealousy. Sometimes it's a result of other things. But when they deal with things, these things follow them for a long time. And sometimes they can't seem to get past it and they become angry. Because sometimes they realize that they were used by a person years ago. Or even abused by a person years ago and they can't get past it. And what has happened is that person that abused or used you, you have allowed them to control your life all those years. Don't do it. You say, well, that sounds great. Don't do it. Let me tell you how to stop it. Don't think about it every day. When you start thinking about it, say, look, I refuse to think about this today. Lord, take this out of my mind. Let me do something different. I'm going to think differently. I want to think good. Matter of fact, Paul gave us an example here. He said, whatever things are pure and true and holy and righteous and good, reflect on those things. Whenever that stuff comes into your mind and you start thinking about the abuse, maybe from someone who's been jealous of you, say, no, not today. You can't control me today. I want to think about the good things. I want to think about the glory of the Lord. I want to think about the salvation of the Lord in my life. I want to think about the things that God has blessed me with in my life, just health and happiness and being able to enjoy uh, some of the simplest things in life and actually make, take notice of those things. Those are important. And in our fast-paced world, we can forget all of this. And our life can become a life of misery if we let it. Let me tell you who's in charge here. You are. You are. It's your choice to be a victim or a victor. Whether it's jealousy or something else, it's your choice. David chose to be a victor. He was unfairly targeted by jealousy, but David didn't let it prevail. And you don't have to either. Would you pray with me? Father, today I thank you for each one here. And as we gather today, Father, I know the most important thing that we can do today is accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. And sometimes we have things that have happened in our life that have have kept us from coming to church. Maybe we've asked the question, why did God do this? Maybe... God didn't do it. Maybe he allowed it so that you could, could prosper, so that you could make the choice and see what's most important. Sometimes we need to go through things in life to help us appreciate and see the things that we take so for granted. Father, I pray that if there's anyone lost in this congregation or listening by Internet today, that they will accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. I pray that if there's anyone today that is uh, dealing with burdens, some that are untold, some that are overwhelming, that they will give them over to you today. If they're dealing with the battleground of of the mind and the things that have happened in their life or trying to take over, I pray that they will say, not today, not today. Jesus is the good that I'm going to focus on. Jesus is what I'm going to think about. I pray that they will be a victor and not a victim. Today, Father, if there's anyone in here, when we stand in a moment for our invitation, 
I pray that they will come to the altar, receive Jesus as their Lord and Savior. If they're looking for a church home, that they will come whatever their need is. Father, I pray that they will be obedient to it and accept Jesus in his leadership and his salvation. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you stand with me? And as you stand today, I do want to invite you to come forward. If you need Jesus in your life, friends, I beg you, I beg you, do not leave here without accepting him as your personal Lord and Savior. This may be one of the hardest decisions you'll ever make, but I'll tell you, it'll be one of the greatest decisions you'll ever make, and it'll be one of the most life-changing decisions you've ever made. Trust Jesus today. If you're overwhelmed with burdens today, come to the altar, cast that burden on the altar, and do, do this. When you get up and leave that altar, don't pick that burden up and take it back with you. Leave it there. Jesus will take care of that. Leave it there. And know that Jesus is the answer to our problems and the world's problems. But we have to be willing to give it over to him. Will you do that today? Come as you need to come. Come. Our Savior is waiting to enter your heart. Why don't you? nothing in this world to keep you apart. What is your answer to him? You need to come, come.
and thank you. Let me remind you that in a moment, two of our deacons are going to go back there and hold a basket up if you would like to contribute to the Gideon ministry. Powerful ministry and give as the Lord leads you. I want you to notice something today. These are deacons, some inactive, some active. They came to stand with me today by their choice. I didn't ask them. They came on their own to stand with me as your servant and a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I want you to look at each of these men and know that any day of the week, you can call any one of these men and they'll stop what they're doing and talk with you. They're here to serve and they love the Lord Jesus just like I do and just like you do. And I'm thankful that I'm able to serve with a group of men of this caliber. Remember, these men are servants of Jesus Christ. I'm going to pray in a moment and then we will dismiss and remember that we have two deacons that will be in the back uh, to take up the Gideon offering. Please join me as we pray. Father, I thank you for today being able to share your word. Today we go through a lot of things in life and we, we know that burdens, problems, pains, they're all frustrating. They're, they make us angry. They hurt us. They're present. And in most cases, they're unjust. They're unfair. But they still happen. And today I pray for the burdens to be lifted from your people. I pray that you will pry the hands of Satan off of your church, off of the people, off of the people in our country and this world, and that we will focus once again on what's most important. I thank you for these men that made a choice to come and stand with me today. They stand before this congregation as servants of the Most High God, the Lord Jesus Christ, and they stand as servants of the people. I pray today that you will fill us with your spirit as we leave this place and enter the mission field. Endow us with power that we can spread the good news of Jesus. And it is in the blessed name of Jesus Christ and for his kingdom's sake we pray. Amen. Remember the Lord Jesus loves you and I love you. We love and you too. Thank you. Did you hear it? I did. I did. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you.